Okay, here we go. Good morning, everybody. That song is called Basin Street Blues. That was written by Spencer Williams in 1928, and it was recorded by Louis Armstrong the same year. Now, that was played on a horn, by the way, that was made in 1915. So we're talking about, you know, 100-year-old stuff working out. Where do you go on television or on the Internet? And you're going to watch an interview show. And a guy comes out and plays a song. Where do you go and hear this? Well, I'll tell you where. Life After Scientology, right here. And I'm Ron Miscavige. I'm your, as Tony Ortega would say, your proprietor. So good morning, everyone. And I have a very special guest and a very old friend of mine on this morning, which I'm going to, I, I absolutely guarantee you, you're going to love this show. Because this gentleman is uh, very astute. He's walked the walk. He's done things in Scientology that, uh, well, you're going to see what he's done when you when I start the program and I start asking him some questions. Now, before I get into that, maybe you're wondering, why would you come on and play a trumpet on a show that you're going to talk up, take up a morbid subject? Well, I'll tell you why. Just because we're handling some suppressive group that's really harming a lot of people in society doesn't mean that we have to be morbid. We can still enjoy our lives. And music, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the more enjoyable time, things that you could listen to. And I hope you enjoy what I'm doing. And, you know, send in your comments if you don't mind. But there's another thing you can do, and that is this. And this is going to get you out of the uh, pocket of just being a viewer or somebody who spectates and listens to these shows. Do something about it. Now, I'm sure you've heard this said many times by by me or by uh, Mike Rinder on his blog. As a matter of fact, it's the logo for his blog. And maybe Tony Ortega has even said it. What do I mean by that? Well, I'll tell you what. The simplest thing you can do is tell other people, hey, you should watch this, you know, Ron Miscavige's Life After Scientology. You can get educated and enlightened on a suppressive group. Or you could write to your senator or write to your congressman or watch Mike Rinder's blog. Something can be done about it or watch Tony Ortega and get other people to do it. Or you could become a Patreon. I mean, for two bucks, just that, you can say, hey, I'm doing something about it. So that kind of compartments you into those things that you're handling rather than things that you're just worrying about and not doing anything. Now, I know that's long-winded, but I wanted to get that across to you because I'd love if you did that and help us all in this endeavor that we're all doing to to expose this group. Now, before we get started though, there's a couple of Patreons I'd like to mention. And one is Karen Cookson. And that's for $20. And I thank you very much. That's a new Patreon. And welcome to the Club of Patreons. Okay. And then we have Jason Watson for $2. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, remember Sherlock Holmes? That's elementary, Dr. Watson. All right. And then Megan Jimenez for nine dollars and i thank you very much thank you very much for your help now without any further words or maybe a few more i don't think so though it's the end of that please welcome 
my old friend and a great individual, Mike Rinder. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, my old friend, Ron. Yeah. Like, I don't think people know how old our friendship is. Well, I met you in 1971, right? Yep, at St. Hill with my parents. And how many years is that? Uh, don't, don't give me math questions this early in the morning on Sunday. Okay, let's see. 71. <laughs> Nine minus one is eight. Uh, uh, you know, like, wait a going minute. On, uh, 80, going 90, on 50 years. That, that's that's <laughs> 40, 40 some years ago, right? Or about 40 years ago. 48 years ago. 48 years ago. Well, you're better at math than I was. I was going to say 91 years. All right. And, and someone's going to come on and go, no, that's actually 38. Right. Okay. <laughs> So that, that's the first time we met. And um, uh, just as a little inside, and of course you remember this because we talked about it before the show, outside of the qualifications division where you would get your auditing if you're a public, or the HCC rather, Hubbard Guidance Center, there was a log there. And people would sit on a split log waiting for their auditing session. You remember that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyway, those were days that were quite a bit different than they are today. I, I think you might agree with that. Do you? Oh, yes. I, certainly, the world of Scientology was an entirely different, uh, had an entirely different feel to it back in those days. It was like uh, the pressure wasn't there. The, the mad focus on money, the the you know status and everything is oriented towards status it was just people who shared some sort of common interest and ideas of of how to improve their lives who happened to be in the same location and you know a lot of a lot of, it, there was a lot of fun like I, I enjoyed the people that i met the people that i used to hang out with the other kids that were the quote, Scientology kids, the families that we knew, those sort of things were what Scientology represented to me. It wasn't the IAS and fundraising and we're going to, you know, destroy this person and you have to disconnect from that person. None of that stuff ever even entered my world back in those days. I, I agree. And one of the other pleasurable things when I brought my family over do you remember there was the hill that was <clears throat> off to one side and it was grassy and everybody yeah. would gather there and have their lunch and it just what what a hell of a time it was and it, it's turned into something that is diametrically opposed to everything we thought or believed in those days and it went if you could give a, a good well i don't know if this is a good analogy but i talk about the actual movement itself went from dr jekyll into mr hyde it just went rotten and it's rotten to the goddamn core right now. Yeah, although, you know, there was always some rot in the core. Well, that's right, because otherwise it, it couldn't grow if it wasn't there to begin with. Right, right. I, I remember an amusing, th this is amusing now, at the time it was a big flop, there was a guy there who was protesting, and he drove his car onto the grounds, and, <laughs> and he put his hand on the horn and kept blowing it. Now, <laughs> <laughs> this actually happened. Now, that would disturb people in auditing sessions. So here's this horn, bow, going off, you know. So what the staff did, they went over to the hood of the car. They called it a bonnet in England. Right. They opened up the, the hood, and they disconnected his battery. <laughs> That's what they had to do to stop him from blowing the horn. And anyway, he, he gave up. He opened the door, and then they put his battery back together, and he drove off. But Stuff like that. I mean, these days, they'd probably take a machine gun and take them out, you know? Yeah. In those right. days, it was, look, don't do that again and get out of here. Right. Okay, so look, we, we did meet at St. Hill. And mm -hmm. it was, I think it was in 71. And then I went back over, and your parents come back over in 73. But you did something else in 73. Could, could we take that up right now, Mike? Yeah, that was when I joined the Sea Org. And I joined the Sea Org originally in Australia, but then I was going to go to the Apollo to join L. Ron Hubbard. And at the time, the Apollo was in Portugal. So I went to St. Hill. 
as sort of the stop-off point. And when I got to St. Hill, I was told, uh, well, you know, you can go to the Apollo, but you have to do the EPF first, the Estates Project course. I never even heard of it. I didn't even know what that was. And uh, as a matter of fact, the person that told me who I met first then was Marion Powell. Wow. She was the supercargo of, of the FOLO, as it was called then, the Flag Operation Liaison Office. So I had to do the EPF. And, you know, as part of the EPF, you have to do a bunch of sec checks, which they called at the time integrity processing. Yeah. And the person that did my integrity processing sec checking in order to go to the Apollo was your daughter, Denise. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> What a small she was doing world. an internship or something at St. Hill. I wow. guess that's when her and Dave were both training to be auditors. Yeah. Yeah, they were. And, uh, well, I know that Denise always had a good communication cycle. I, I can tell you. I mean, that's my personal experience with her, you know? Yeah, well, it was it was kind of funny being sec-checked by someone like uh, a, a girl who was younger than me. Yeah. And I was 18 at the time, and she was like 14 or something, I guess. Wow. 13, maybe. Well, well how old was she in 1973? She was born well, in 1960, right? She was born in 1960. She should be 13 years old. Right. At April 30th, 1960, her and David were born. You, you know right. the twin. Right. Well, for the, the listeners, David has a twin, which is Denise. That's his twin sister. She was my sex check. Wow. Well, what what did happen then? Did you not go to the Apollo? I thought you were. No, went. I did. Like shortly thereafter, you know, a couple of months later, I went to the Apollo and uh, in Lisbon at the time. And I arrived thinking that I was going there to to do a training program on the the OEC, the Organizational Executive Course, to return to Australia to be a Sea Org Executive in Australia. And when I got there, Maria Starkey, Norman Starkey's former wife, who's now deceased, was the the person in charge of personnel assignments. And she says, oh, you've been traded. You're going to be posted as a deckhand. And wow. I'm like, what? <laughs> what does that mean? Oh, you're going to go and, you know, scrape paint on the outside of the ship and, and, and put caulking in the in the teak decks of the Apollo. I'm like, no, no, I'm not. Oh, yeah, you are. You're in the Sea Org now, dude. That's what happens. You got traded. That's what I was told. You were traded. I'm like, I don't like know a, what this means. Wait, like, like, a, like a slave, right? Exactly. They traded that's exactly, slaves. Though. That's exactly what it was, Ruddy. It was like, you are now an indentured servant. You belong to us. We own you. And you're going to do whatever we tell you to do because there is no other option. Now I'm sitting on a boat in Lisbon Harbor and I've turned over my passport. I don't have any money. I don't have any anything. I'm just here I am. Now I'm stuck. Wow. Jesus like Christ. First number of months. All I wanted to do was get off the Apollo. I did not want to be there at all. Wow. And, you know, the, set, the the first assignment that I had on the Apollo running, you're going to love this. As a deckhand, I was considered to be one of those sort of expendable people. You know, there's always people around in the Sea Org that get used for every crap assignment that nobody else wants to do. Yeah, it, it's, okay. like the, it's like the bottom feeders, right? Exactly. Like the guys that get that get told, oh, uh, someone needs to go pick up the garbage in the parking lot because Tom Cruise is showing up. Yeah, yeah that guy. You know, yep. all the important people don't do that sort of stuff. It's the guys that can be spared. And I was one of the guys that could be spared. So you know what my first job was? What's that? Sitting up all night outside of the cabin where Bruce Welch was being held. Bruce oh. Welch was the pilot of the introspection rundown. In fact, Bruce Welch was the only person who ever 
did the introspection rundown before Hubbard announced and released it in January of 1974 as the technical breakthrough of 1974 and the final reason that psychiatry no longer need exist. Wow. And it was all based on one guy. That, so, was, that was the entire research he did, right? That was it. The entire thing. And, and Bruce Welch was this big guy and it, like it was terrifying to me I, I here I am I don't know anything and I'm sitting there outside of this room and this room has all these ropes from the door attached to the bulkhead across the hallway so that he couldn't pull the door open Jeez. and he was inside there and he had literally torn apart a steel locker with his bare hands and stuffed it out a porthole torn apart the bed and the mattress and stuffed it out the porthole and <laughs> spent the entire time screaming, I want, I want a conference with the Commodore right now. I Get want what? The Commodore. LRH. Unbelievable. Get him down here right now. And like I'm being told, you got it. You may not make a sound and don't do anything that upsets him. I'm like, I'm sitting there like, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. And then some guys would come down to take him to the bathroom, and it would be six of them. Like literally, two guys on each leg and two guys and, and guys on each arm. Wow. And he'd be like punching them and kicking them. It was like crazy. That was my first job on the Apollo. Well, and I can see how you could be the international spokesman based on that, Mike. <laughs> exactly. Unbelievable. Oh, well. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Okay, well, then what happened was after I performed my functions so well doing that, I became, uh, Hubbard decided he needed to do something about the PR area control in Portugal. And the ship was sailing between Portugal, the Azores, which are Spanish islands, Madeira, like the mainland Portugal, there were a number of ports there, Setubal, Porto, Lisbon, and then this island in the middle of the Atlantic called Madeira, which is a Portuguese island, and then the Azores, which is Spanish, that are off the coast of Africa. It was sort of making a circuit like this. And there was all sorts of difficulties with the government in Portugal, and the Apollo, just prior to that, had been kicked out of Morocco and you know escorted out of the port with gunships after having been kicked out of spain out the kicked out of greece kicked out of Italy. like it was like this string of failures of establishing any safe operating environment so yeah. hubbard decided we need to do something to ingratiate ourselves with the portuguese government so he decided to set up a, a a unit in Punchal, Madeira, this little island. And that unit would do surveys on tourists because tourism is the biggest source of funding in Portugal to find out what they really wanted using his brilliant survey tech. Right. So there was a little unit set up to do surveying. There were uh, four women, Jim Dinkelsey, who was the LRH medical officer, who had screwed up because he gave an uh, injection uh, to Hubbard that he did wrong. So he got, you're out and yeah. sent to the shore unit and me. And I was like the new kid on the block and I was supposed to handle the telexes and the mail from the airport and that sort of stuff. And that was basically all I did. Okay, wow. fast forward, I was there for like nine months and in, Early 1974, I think it was April 25th of 1974, there was a, a revolution in Portugal. And there was a takeover by the army. And they took over the government of Spinoza and removed him and became a military hunter dictatorship in, in Portugal. Okay, long story short, there were all these rumors that were being spread around in Portugal at the time that the Apollo is a CIA ship. Now, for those of you that may not be familiar with this, 
The Apollo, even though it was Hubbard's home and the international headquarters of Scientology, was not Scientology. There was a, quote, Shaw story that this was the Operation and Transport Corporation, an international management consulting consortium that was operating on the Apollo, not that it was Scientology. So, and that was to protect Hubbard in some way. So there was this lie that the Apollo and all of the crew were operating on full time. Yeah. And that lie obviously creates suspicion and doubt. So then there started to be slogans painted on the wall, CIA, Apollo equals CIA. People thought that this was a spy ship for the CIA. And now with this new military government that the United States didn't like, they were convinced that this, the Apollo was a spy ship. Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay, so this famous incident happened in Portugal, in Funchal, Madeira, where the Apollo was. A whole bunch of people in the local town and realize Funchal, Madeira is a tiny little town on a tiny little island a thousand miles away from mainland Portugal. It's in the middle of the Atlantic. There is nothing, wow. nothing. And people there are stir crazy. There's nothing to do, literally. Yeah. You're like, it's just so. There's all these cafes that they have down on the main street, and everybody sits out there and drinks beer and coffee and et cetera, et cetera. All the young kids hanging out, and some guy starts going, okay, what we need to do is go down and, t and get rid of the CIA ship that's sitting in our harbor. So they loaded up a bunch of taxis with stones and they went down and started throwing rocks at Jeez. the Apollo. I'm God, serious. Damn. Like, and it was called the Rock Festival. It was pretty, and they um like there were a whole bunch of people who had motorcycles and they pushed them into the water and they took the lines off the ship so that like set adrift from the dock. Wow. Okay. But I wasn't on the ship. I was in our little office apartment above the office in the sit in the town. And I was the only one that was there. Wow. So the ship sails out of the harbor after being untied, and I'm left. Jesus so Christ. The next door neighbor that lived in the same apartment building was a captain in the army there. And we had become somewhat friendly with him, nice guy. And he comes knocking on the door and he says, in his broken English, there's trouble at the ship, there's trouble at the ship. Just stay here, don't go, don't leave. And I'm like, huh? He says, don't leave, whatever you do, don't answer the door, don't, don't close the windows, it, it's trouble. And I'm like, what the? <laughs> what? And he says, I'll be back. I'm going to go get a helicopter to come and pick you off the roof. Oh, my God. I'm like, seriously? He says, oh, it's big trouble, big trouble. So I close the door. I turn out all the lights. I turn the blinds. And pretty soon I start hearing this noise. And the next thing I see is three, four of those you know, big army trucks with the canvas backs yeah, pull yeah. up in the square outside of the apartment building and all these soldiers jump out, like 50 soldiers with machine guns. Jesus Christ almighty. This and is they surround the building. And I'm like, the soldiers are coming to get me. No, what was happening was all the protesters from the Apollo after it sailed away decided that they were going to come because they knew that we were attached to the Apollo we're going to come and protest outside of the office and apartment. The Whoa. office was at the bottom and the apartment was above it. So yeah. next thing, there's like 2,000 people out in the square shouting to get me out of there and, you know, death to the Apollo and death to CIA and blah, blah, blah. And I'm in there and I'm being protected by the army that hates the CIA. Wow. And the guy hasn't come back like five hours later. He finally shows up and he says, um, it'll be okay. Just come downstairs. They just want to search through the office and then they'll let you go. And I'm like, 
okay, uh, are you sure? He says, yeah, 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 I've got all my men down there, don't worry. So I go downstairs, and there's all these people coming, and they wanted to search the office. And I'm like, go ahead, there's nothing here. There's like communications course booklets. Yeah. Like no CIA stuff here. So he says, it'll be fine. As soon as they're done searching, you can go. Okay, he takes off. The next thing that happens is the Guardia Fiscal shows up. The they're like the immigration police, the security force. Right. And they go, Oh, you can't leave. I'm like, why not? He told me I could. Well, you don't have the appropriate uh, authorization to leave, and we're under martial law and blah blah blah, so you have to stay here. And I'm like, anyway, I eventually made it back to the Apollo. And later that night, the Apollo sailed and left Portugal and sailed across the Atlantic, intending to go to the United States. Like the plan was to arrive in Charleston, South Carolina on the Apollo. Right. And 12 miles offshore, there was a radio transmission from Foster Tompkins. Right. I remember Foster. Yeah. Father of Sterling and Justin. Yeah. Saying the FBI, the IRS, the DEA are waiting on the dock. God. So the Apollo turned around and we sailed to Bermuda. Wow, I'll tell you, actually, you're lucky to be alive. You know that? Well, I'm not sure there's that. I mean, it was harrowing. I don't think it was really life-threatening. I mean, I don't know. Maybe. Well, it sounds like yeah. it was. I mean, look at What if somebody threw a rock and hit you on the head by accident? You'd be dead. Yeah, but what if a piano fell out of a building while I'm walking by, too, you know? Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fascinating story. This is something I did not know happened to you. That there you go. See, wow. I told you there'd be shit that you didn't know. Well, that's even, even as long as we've known each other. I know. I told you there was stuff that you don't know. This is unbelievable. Now, let's spin back a little bit, though. When the first, you met LRH then, obviously, right? Yes, I did. What was your first impression of him when you met him the first time? I was scared shitless. Really? It was like, a sort of a terrifying experience. Actually, what happened was he used to have, he would sit in his research room, his office on the prom deck, the top deck of the Apollo. And he would come out at like four o'clock in the morning and hold court with the uh, aides and Mary Sue and whoever else was around up there in the offices that were near his, his office. Right. And, you know, he'd walk out and someone would see him and say, oh, good morning, sir, blah, blah, blah. And one of the offices that was up there was Ken Urquhart's office, the LRH personal communicator. Right. And every communication to Hubbard has to go through Ken Urquhart's office. So I had some communication that I was taking to Ken Urquhart and I was running up the stairs and I literally, I ran up the stairs without realizing, and Hubba was standing at the top of the stairs, and I nearly ran into him. Wow. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and he looks at me, he says, well, there's someone in a hurry. Move. And he sort of stands aside, and I'm like, and everybody's looking at me like, oh, my God, this guy just fucked up big time. Like, he just wow. nearly ran into the Commodore, like, yeah. crime of all crimes. Right. Hubbard didn't seem to mind at all. Like, he was like, oh, you know, someone's actually working, you know, doing, doing yeah. something useful, running, at least running to try and get to where he was going. No, I actually... And, but to me, it was like, I just had an encounter with God. Yeah. You know, like, from a very early age, Hubbard had been on such an enormously sacred pedestal in my mind and in everything. Like, it's hard for people to understand how you get indoctrinated into this idea that 
L. Ron Hubbard has the answers to literally everything about life. I, everything I, about you, everything about how to think, everything about how to act, everything about everything, yeah. <laughs> literally. You know, the old expression, do what Ron says, yeah. it, it is literally a, a mantra for Scientologists. And yeah. it, it means he already figured out the answer. All you need to do is find out what he said about it, and you'll have the answer to whatever it is that you need to know about. And oh, so yeah. in in the mind of a, of a child to begin with, and then I get, at the time I was like a, a teenager, this is like the guy who has the answers not just to life, but to eternity. Yeah. So... In my mind, he is he is someone to be revered. And though, you know, he he wrote things saying, well, you know, I'm just a man and I don't want to be treated like a god and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, those words are pretty hollow when you actually look at the other things that he said, like keeping Scientology working, which dictates that. The only answers to life are the ones that he found. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And you were born, I mean, were your parents in Scientology when you were born? No, when I, they started when I was like five or six. Well, that's pretty goddamn young, though. I mean, in your whole time with them, you're being indoctrinated. And you, it would be like a person raised in a Catholic family being taught about Jesus Christ, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely right. Yeah. In fact, more. I mean, to some extent, the 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 idea of Jesus Christ is is based on just a concept and a bunch of parables, yeah. and things that other people wrote about. Him. No, Hubbard it went beyond that. He has actually described the answers to everything about life. Yeah, you can't go to the uh, lectures of Jesus Christ to find out how to handle interpersonal relationships. No, nope. you can't go to the writings of Jesus Christ to tell you how to become an immortal spiritual being. No, you know it's just it's a it's on a whole nother plane, and it's it's really kind of difficult for anybody that hasn't been immersed in that way of thinking to understand it yeah I, I i see that and i'll tell you like sometimes i get comments or little people write in saying you know how could people just be so engrossed in scientology that you, you can't think otherwise well it's all the indoctrination and if you're born well you're not born into you were five years old you start getting indoctrinated that is all you know and especially by your parents who are your survival entities I mean, they feed you, they clothe you, they take care of you. So you have a tendency to listen to what they have to say and believe it. Yeah. And, and you know, people also often ask, well, how is it that, like, is everybody just dumb that gets involved in Scientology? Is, is this just a, a con game for the, for the weak-minded fools yeah. of the world? And the answer to that is no. And I'm not, like... I started out without really much choice. I was a kid. Yeah. But there are plenty of smart people, people that I have an enormous amount of respect for, who got involved in Scientology way later, when they were adults. Yeah. But the reason is because it appeals to good people. It is designed to appeal to good people, to people who want to help other people, to people who want to help themselves to people that believe that they have found a way of helping themselves and helping others. And that is what the pitch of Scientology is at the outset. Well, I'll tell you, that's about what I've described it as because I think that's the common denominator of people who are in Scientology who are not a bunch of fucking dummies. Right. They mostly want to have, well, first of all, when you get in, as you just said, you, they want to help themselves. 
But you do have this feeling of wanting to help others. And that's why you'd recruit people into becoming part of this movement. Or, you know, as I did, I got many people to join this. Well, not many, but uh, some to join the Sea Org. Because I thought, okay, we could stand help to help us propagate all of our knowledge that we, L. Ron Hubbard knows about life. So they, other people on this planet can be helped. So every man, woman, and child can be helped. Right. That's, yeah, you're exactly right on that, Mike. I totally agree with you.